G'day and welcome to MCC Online. It's great that you can join with us this week as we worship our God together. Uh, this week we're going to hear from Heath. He's going to be speaking from 1 Peter uh, about living in exile. Uh, I'm sure this will be a great encouragement for us all, especially those that feel like me at the moment, that our, our faith and our beliefs are all under, under question. They're all being challenged by the world. Uh, we feel like everything is just turned upside down at the moment with all the changes that are going on around us. So uh, I'm sure hearing from, um, from what Peter had to write there, uh, we'll hear that uh, things for the church were the same many, many years ago when he was writing as well. Uh, we'd love to hear from you this morning. Uh, so if you've got the opportunity to uh, tell us that you're here on Facebook, why don't you put something in the comments section, tell us that you're watching, tell us who you're watching with as well understand that a few of you already have, uh, have put that message up and um, it's, it's good to see that a few of you are meeting with each other this morning, uh, especially now that we can have up to 20 people in our homes uh, as well. So uh, I encourage you to, to reach out to one another, join together, especially on a Sunday morning to, to watch the service together. Do it in a COVID safe way, of course, and make sure you uh, observe those space restrictions and those hygiene factors and things but uh, it would be great if we can all be joining together in each other's homes over this period where we can't get together and worship in the church building. Now tonight we're going to have another one of our inspiring conversations via the Zoom video conferencing uh, and it looks a little delicious with uh, a cooking class going to be held by Beth uh, she's going to be showing us how to make apple crumble. Uh, apologies to those people who thought it was going to be Italian meatballs. I think she had a good long hard think about that and thought people like myself aren't going to be able to do something as complicated as Italian meatballs. Uh, but we'll certainly give it a crack with the apple crumble. So I'm looking forward to hearing what Beth's got to say, uh, especially around her experience of bringing faith-based values into her work as well. So uh, she'll lead that conversation. So if you're interested in cooking, if you've got a job and uh, just want some tips on how to bring your faith into work and uh, want to just join that discussion, log in via Zoom. The details are in the bulletin. Or if you can't access the bulletin, reach out to us on Facebook now and we'll send you those details a bit later on. Uh, for our voting members, don't forget we have a meeting next Sunday at 2 o'clock. Uh, details of that have been in the emails and the bulletin this week, but we really need to know today if you're attending that meeting. Uh, due to the space restrictions and number of people that we can have in the church at any one time at the moment, uh, we may need a second venue. So we need to know whether you're planning to come uh, so that we can go through that process. And we'll let you all know during the week uh, whether it's one venue or two and where it is that we need you to go next Sunday for our meeting at two o'clock. So if you've got any questions, reach out to us either on Facebook or, or via the email and uh, we'll attempt to come back to you with the answers on that one. That's it for the news this week. Uh, obviously a lot going on in our communities, a lot going on around the world at the moment. So let's just pray, ask the Holy Spirit to join with us this morning in order that we can worship the Lord together. Holy Spirit, as you join with us in our living rooms, in our bedrooms and wherever it might be that we're watching, we would just pray that you'd be with us, uh, that you'd open our hearts and our minds to the message that's given to us through song, through the prayers, through the Bible and through the word that Heath's going to bring us a bit later on. Lord, we thank you again for the opportunity that we can meet in small groups at the moment. But Lord, we also ask uh, for an opening up of everything so that we can join together uh, in the bigger group sometime in the near future. Bless us this morning and be with us. In your son's name we pray, Lord. Amen. And you will reign forever. Let your glory fill the earth. Let's join together as we sing and behold our God.
It's your breath in our lungs, and so we pour out our praise to you only. Bible reading comes from 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 1 and 2. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, strangers in the world, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling by his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Let us pray. Let us consider the words of Lamentations. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Heavenly Father, we give praise to you for your love. A love 
that allowed you to send your son Jesus Christ, that he would die that our sins may be forgiven. Help us to praise you because of your mercies new every morning. Help us to praise you because of your faithfulness. And may we also be faithful. We give thanks to you for so many things. As a nation, we can thank you that we have flattened the COVID curve, but much more needs to be done. Guide our governments that they may continue to make wise decisions. Guide our citizens that they may continue to be responsible. Help us to know life in Jesus. Help us to be regular in prayer and reading your word. Help us to apply the things that we have learnt. Help us to grow in community around Jesus. We pray for the small groups, some of which have got back together. We pray for those in need, particularly the elderly who have been unwell. We pray for those in hospital. We also pray for those in aged care. We pray for Heath and Jeremy, our pastors, and our leadership team. We pray for the congregational meeting coming soon, especially as we consider the proposed building project. Help us to be involved in Mission for Jesus. Help us to continue to support the missionaries we support, both overseas and here in Australia. We remember the established church plant and pray for their leadership and their people. Heavenly Father, help us to develop ways and strategies that we can more effectively impact our local community, that through this, more and more people will know Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. We pray in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning, Church. Welcome again to Sunday Church Online at MCC. So glad that you can join us. Today we embark on a new series in the book of 1 Peter, the first letter that Peter wrote from Rome to people who were scattered across Asia, and he wrote to encourage them in their faith. And I believe that God has given us this letter for times that we are living in right now. So I invite you, that if you haven't already picked up a Bible, to pick it up. And we're going to look at 1 Peter 1. It's already been read to us and all of those difficult names and places. But let's look at it together. But first, I want to start by talking about another book. And it's an amazing book. It's written by an Australian author called Tim Winton. And it's called The Turning. That's what it looks like, The Turning. It's also been made into a feature film. And The Turning seems like a, a bunch of disconnected stories uh, in this sleepy seaside village town called White Point. And it's really about the people who populate that town and the many dysfunctions and glories that they go through together. But right in the middle of that book is a chapter named after the title, The Turning. It's an amazing chapter of two people who come to the town of White Point and people's lives begin to be changed forever. And the first person that they encounter is a lady called Raylene. She's had a very tough life and still living in a very tough situation. And yet this couple named Dan and Shelley live out their faith as Christian people. And you don't really realise that that's what's happening until you're almost towards the end of the chapter. But Dan and Shelley are just different from everyone else. They've got their own issues. They've had problems. And God has brought them through to an amazing place. And they have then accepted those around them in this place. And they're changing the lives. In fact, they're changing the communities. Just one couple in a very settled town making a difference. That's what Peter is really writing to. He's actually writing to a people who have settled all around but instead of having moved to the towns, they're still actually living in the towns in which they were brought up. And yet here he still calls them exiles. In verse 1, Peter says he's an apostle of Jesus Christ. He has a message from Jesus for the people that he's writing to. And he says, I am writing to God's elect 
exiles scattered throughout the provinces and we're all listed there. He's writing to exiles. But as we discover later, these people have always lived in these places. They've always rubbed shoulders with the people in their village. They're part of the fabric and nature of the town. And yet Jesus still calls them exiles. Sometimes it's translated as aliens or even strangers. How could you be an alien or a stranger? How could you be an exile in your own hometown? Well, that's what Peter's writing about. He's writing about the fact that when we become a follower of Jesus, that our allegiances are changed, our lives are changed, our priorities are changed, our desires are changed. Ultimately, everything about us is transformed piece by piece because we now belong to another country. We belong to another nation, not the one which we grow up in, but a heavenly one. We're called citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And when Peter says that you're exiles, he's reminding us that when we start to follow Jesus, we will feel out of place, even in our own hometowns. We'll feel like we don't fit in as we used to fit in. And this letter is a beautiful description of the feeling that that has on us and how we as people can work against those feelings to still be able to have the kind of impact on the villages and the places in which we live, just as Dan and Shelley did in that little town called White Point. It's a great book, I suggest you read it, but when Paul, sorry, when Peter writes here to the exiles, they're right in their own hometown and yet they feel out of place. I wonder if you feel out of place in the culture in which we live here. Perhaps people around you indulge in activities and behaviours that don't seem to match with how you want to live anymore. Or perhaps they have thoughts and uh, opinions which are so different to yours. And perhaps even you might remember that I used to think just like that, but now I don't. And the change is not through education. The change is not through politics. The change is through Jesus. That's what's happening to the people of Peter's day. And I believe as we head into the rest of this century, the 21st century, that more and more you and I will feel like aliens and strangers in exile, that we're not at home. Or as Dorothy says in The Wizard of Oz, we're not in Kansas anymore. Instead of being in a black and white world, suddenly it's in technicolor and the whole world looks different. And the place where we live is brought alive by God. And we see things differently and we feel things differently. That's what it means to live as an exile. And just before we start, I want to say that when we do live in exile, it's like living in a foreign country. And there are kind of three ways that most people who move to a new country tend to operate. Firstly, they might try to what we might call assimilate, that is, to be just like the people around them so that they don't stick out, so that they don't uh, cause any fuss. They might learn the language, learn the customs, learn the idiosyncrasies of that culture and try to imitate as much as possible everyone around them so that they are absorbed, if you like, into the wider culture. There's nothing significantly different about them and that's their whole aim, to assimilate so that they're just like everyone else. That's a danger for us as Christians, that as we start to see differences between the way that we want to live and how Jesus wants for us to live, how our friends want to live, our family wants to live, we'll always be tempted to try and be just like everybody else because no one wants to stick out. No one wants to feel like a stranger. No one wants to feel like they're alienated. And yet that's one of the very real options that's given to us. The second way when people arrive in a new place, in a new culture, is that instead of assimilating, instead they want to preserve everything about themselves. And so they isolate. They might all move to the same suburb. They might all uh, participate in their own shops. They have like a little village of their own where everything is done in their original language and their original way of living. And even though they're in a different place, they're seeking to preserve as much as possible who they are apart from the people around them. 
They're making no efforts to be the same. They're making no efforts to communicate. They're simply living completely differently, just as they've always lived in the past. So instead of assimilation, there tends to be isolation. And that's a temptation for us as well as Christians. Sometimes we're tempted to live in what's sometimes called the Christian bubble. We have Christian schools and we have Christian groups that we go to and we only have Christian friends and we only have Christian sporting events and we only go to concerts that are put on by Christian people. It's easy, at least in Australia, for the limited time in which we've been living to live in a Christian bubble, to live in isolation, in some ways to protect ourselves from the differences that we feel when we live in our surrounding culture. So we can either assimilate and be just like everyone or isolate and seek to preserve something. But God, as we go through 1 Peter, is going to call for us to do something that's much more rewarding and much more difficult. He's going to ask for us to integrate with the culture, to celebrate the good things that are part of the culture in which you and I are a part, but at the same time to live for the future kingdom and particularly to live for the king, King Jesus. And in the passage that was uh, read to us, there are things that we're told about this God whom we're going to live for. Three things, actually, represented by the three persons of the Godhead. The triune God is the one who helps us. Look at the things that are said. It says in verse 2 that we've been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. That is, it was always God's plan to have a people that he would call his own from the very beginning of the world. He called Adam his son. We were to be his people. And Adam and Eve, as our representatives, rejected God and rejected the plans that God had for them. And ever since, God's been pursuing a people that he can call his own. And he started with just one very small family, Abraham and Sarah. And from that small beginning became a people who were chosen, not because they were great, not because they were wonderful, but because they were faithful. And they were the ones to represent who God is and what it means to be God's people. So God chose these people, God the Father, the Father adopting us into his family. The second part that we read is that it's through, that is, the means of which this happens to become part of the family of God is through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. The second person, or the third person sometimes, as it's called, of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, who works in people's lives to set them apart. That's ultimately what sanctify means. It means to set apart for a particular purpose. And so we're told that God has chosen us despite our weaknesses and failings, despite all of the things that have gone wrong in our rebellion against him. And he then has set us apart for a very special work. What is the special work that the Spirit is going to do in us? Well, it says it's so that we might be obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ. You and I, as God's people, chosen by him, set apart by the Holy Spirit, are to live obedient lives under the kingship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that an amazing privilege and an amazing adventure? God says that's his purpose for his people. And here, Peter is saying, and his people who live for this other kingdom, this heavenly kingdom, are going to feel and experience being exiles, being strangers in a strange land, being those who feel as though they've been alienated from their very own people. I just want to say at this point that even though that can feel difficult, we need to understand that Jesus also understands what this means. In the early chapters of Luke, we read that Jesus grew up in a town called Nazareth. And as he grew up, it says he grew in favour with God and with people. And that at a certain point, God identified Jesus as his son. It was at his baptism. And God, the voice from heaven says, you are my son with whom I am well pleased. People, listen to him. That's the God, the father, 
recognizing Jesus, the son, the spirit is the one who falls upon Jesus like a dove. Once again, the three persons of the Godhead involved in identifying Jesus as God's own son. And then straight after that, having faced all of the temptations that you and I face, Jesus goes to his own hometown and he speaks to his hometown about his purpose in this life about his obedience to his heavenly father, where he's going to bring good news to the poor. He's going to release captives. He's going to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And the people of Jesus' own hometown say, who is this? Isn't this Joseph's son? Jesus, in a very real way, humanly speaking, knows what it's like to be deeply connected with a people with Nazareth. These are his people. This is his village. These are the people that he went up to Jerusalem with all his life. These are the people that he's rubbed shoulders with day in and day out. And yet it tells us in this story that they actually reject him, that he is exiled in a way, and he feels abandoned. And that would have been hard for him. And I'm going to tell you now that Peter tells us it's going to be hard for us too, when we become God's children through Jesus, and he is our father, we too will feel the same kind of dislocation that Jesus felt from his own people. Jesus, of course, knew that he belonged ultimately to his heavenly father. And Peter, at this very beginning of the letter, wants for us to know the same thing, that we've been chosen by God the Father, that we've been set aside by the Holy Spirit for a very particular purpose. And that purpose is to be obedient to Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be an exile. It means to live in obedience to Jesus rather than in obedience to the culture in which we live. And there are some awesome aspects of our culture that we can celebrate as God-given and good. And there are some parts which we mourn and grieve over the injustice and the unforgiveness the racism and the hatred and the bigotry, all of those things that cause us pain, we're called to live as obedient people to Jesus. And we're told that this comes at a great cost to Jesus himself. The very last phrase says, we're obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Now, to those whom Peter was writing and for many who've read the Bible, Whenever we read sprinkled with blood, we understand that there was some sacrifice involved, that somehow something, usually an animal, died so that people could be forgiven, so that people could be set free, so that there'd be a cost paid for mistakes that have been made. And here we're told that God has chosen us and set us aside and our purpose is to be obedient but it's not done in our own strength. It's done in the strength of Jesus who has given his own life, his blood, so that we might be forgiven, so that we might be set free and part of God's people. So Peter here at the very beginning is saying, God has chosen us to be his people and that we might be obedient. God's always been looking for his own people who will show what he is like to a watching world. We're not called to assimilate and look just like everybody else and hide, but we're not called to isolate and be away from everyone so that no one sees it, but we're to integrate into our culture and to live for Jesus so that people might see what it looks like to truly be one of God's people, to live a full life. Jesus said he came to give life and life to the full. Do you believe that? Peter does. And the people whom he's writing to need encouragement that the life that God has given is a full and wonderful life. But there are consequences. And as we go through, we're going to see the kinds of consequences that happen when we become obedient to Jesus, the purpose that God has given us, especially when it's against those who may be wanting to rebel against the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Even our own families, even our own village may find that difficult. In the story of Jesus at Nazareth, his hometown that rejected him, when we read a bit further on, it says that the people of his town were so angry with him, they wanted to throw him off a cliff. 
That's pretty outrageous. That's anger at another level. Jesus himself has experienced it. And I want to invite you on the journey and the adventure of what it means to look and to live as an exile in our own hometown. To know ultimately that this is not our own place, but there's a place we're going to. There's an old story which I've heard many times, but I love and I want to share it with you. It's of a time when the then president, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, was returning home from a trip overseas. And as the president uh, was greeted so warmly at the docks, they traveled by ship in the 50s, and he uh, returned on that ship and he was walking down the gangplank and there was a band playing the music of the national anthem and there were people cheering, so happy to see him when he had come home. On the same ship, there was a man who was on his own returning from being a missionary in India. He truly knew what it was to be a stranger in a culture, to come from America to live in India all his life. And he returned home on the same ship, but there was no fanfare. There was no band. There was no adulation and screaming of his name. In fact, there was no one, not even from the people who had sent him overseas. No one was there to welcome him. And when he got back to the very small single bedroom hotel that he was in, in the poor part of town, he was bitter and cried out to God and said, the President of the United States has all of these people who love and adore him. And yet there was no one who would welcome me home. And this missionary records that God said to him very clearly in a voice, my son, you're not home yet. Sometimes as exiles, we feel abandoned. Sometimes we feel like we're far from home. And yet God was reminding that missionary and us that we're not home yet in this world. And we need to remember that as we go through the book of 1 Peter. I trust that you'll enjoy it as we go through. Looking forward to sharing with you over these next couple of weeks, particularly about living the life that Jesus gives to us and then living a holy life as the life that Jesus gives. Let's pray and then we'll finish our time. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your goodness to us. We thank you that you chose us, not because of our goodness, but because of your goodness and grace. Help us to be people who see how to live in the world in which we're a part. Even if we've grown up in these places, now that you've called us by your spirit to be obedient to the Lord Jesus, help us to navigate our way through this world so that we might be people who show others what it means to live for you. Help us to do that. We can't do it on our own. We need your strength. We need your help. We need your forgiveness for when we've done it wrong. We ask and pray that you would use our lives, precious to you, paid for by the sprinkling of Jesus' blood. Help our lives to demonstrate and display your goodness to people all around us. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Isn't it wonderful to have such an amazing father who loves and cares for us in every aspect of our lives? Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. He is healer, awesome in power. There is no one like our God.
This hymn uses words that some of us may not be familiar with with our everyday language, but it's a beautiful illustration of Jesus' grace to us. Let's sing Rock of Ages together. Even in our weakness and in our sins, you came down to rescue us and find us and restore us to be one with you. Let's sing You Alone Can Rescue together so that we can remember the wonders of what Jesus has done for us.
Hey, thanks again, uh, church, for joining us this morning. I just want to let you know about one thing as you head off through the day. Jeremy, our pastor, uh, who's been sharing with us about the Good Samaritan, has finally agreed to let uh, his wife share with us. And so we're really looking forward to Beth Hodson coming tonight to our inspiring conversation. Starts at 7 p.m. Go to our website or to Facebook. You'll find a link there. And Beth is going to share with us her testimony about life and about business and how her business, particularly learning to cook with kids, all came about. And if you look up the ingredients, we can make apple crumble as we go and eat it at the end together. So that's Inspiring Conversations tonight, 7 p.m. Don't forget, may the Lord bless you, may he keep you and make his face to shine upon you and he be gracious to you. May he lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.